when Star Wars came out, everybody said, oh, it's a silly movie. It's just a, a bunch of space battles and stuff. It's not real. There's nothing behind it. And I said, well, there is stuff behind it. It's not just a space battle. There's more to it than that. It's much, much more complicated than that. In my previous Star Wars videos, I attempted to explain the core mechanics of Star Wars from the ground up while providing insights into the philosophies of the Jedi, the Sith, as well as the cyclical nature of the Force through the lens of Nietzschean philosophy. To my credit, my videos led millions of people to have a broader appreciation of Star Wars as a franchise. However, judging from the accumulated comments, a significant amount of people did not fully grasp the inner workings of the Force and its influence throughout the entire setting. Certain elements, such as the intrinsically harmful effects of the dark side and the functional meaning of balance in regards to good winning over evil, were briefly mentioned and contextualized, but lacked emphasis, as I had assumed that they were common knowledge. Despite my attempts, widespread ignorance of the metaphysical mechanics of the Force alongside a deep-felt hatred for the Jedi led many to have an incomplete conclusion on the structural and thematic meaning of Star Wars. This failure is both mine and an echo of the broader misunderstandings of the Star Wars community. As such, to fully contextualize and explain the Force, a systematic top-down re-examination of Star Wars must be performed, using the prequels and original movies by George Lucas as the primary sources. As a franchise, Star Wars is a universe that spans across multiple mediums through film, comic books, novels, and video games. The central movies present the main narrative, but leave space in-universe and timeline that allow writers to make up their own stories that take place within the setting. Although never directly mentioned, a set of rules form a baseline for all these stories to tie into the central movies. The characters may not know the full extent of the rules, and no writer has ever attempted to lay down the entire structure in a systematic fashion. Yet, nonetheless, they exist, and most stories follow them. The primary axiom that unifies all of Star Wars is the Force. As Obi-Wan explains in the original movie, it is an energy field that binds all life together. The second axiom is the basis for the spread of life, midi-chlorians. At some point in time, Microscopic lifeforms within cells managed to connect themselves to the Force, which created all other life. As Qui-Gon explains, the rest of life could not exist without the Force or midichlorians. I've been wondering, what are midichlorians? Midichlorians are a microscopic life form that resides within all living cells, and we are symbionts with them. Symbionts? Life forms living together for mutual advantage. Without the midichlorians, life could not exist, and we would have no knowledge of the Force. This birth of midichlorians led to the prolification of life across the galaxy. It resulted in two unifying aspects that represent the flourishing and symbiosis of life and the Force. The first is what is called the Living Force, and the second is called the Cosmic Force. In Empire Strikes Back, Yoda explains that life feeds the Force, and the Force surrounds everything and ties it all together. As life spreads, the Force increases in influence through its attachment to life, and then cosmically directs life to connect everything for the sake of furthering its spread, creating a feedback loop. In Star Wars, this continual relationship between the living and cosmic Force is called balance. It is a natural state of harmony between all life forms, from plant life to animals. However, life produced a paradoxical existence, sapience. Different from other life forms, some animals develop a higher degree of cognition that permits them to focus their minds and become self-aware of their actions. Such beings are rational animals, capable of volitional choice and the ability to conceptualize reality to a higher degree and reshape it for their future benefits. Modeled after human sapiens in our world, all aliens and humans in the Star Wars galaxy operate on the same general degree of cognition and psychology, regardless of their physical features. On the whole, although sapien beings can grasp and reshape reality, alone, they do not change the core dynamics of the setting. 
all life forms continue to exist symbiotically with the Force, bound through the midichlorians. As life continually flourishes under the living Force, the Force as a whole connects everything through the cosmic Force to such a degree that luck, chance, and coincidence do not seem to exist. Will you take him with you? Is he to become a Jedi? Yes. Our meeting was not a coincidence. Nothing happens by accident. I call it luck. In my experience, there's no such thing as luck. However, in very rare instances, perhaps due to random chance or genetics, certain animals are born with a larger number of midichlorians within their bodies. This occurrence happens across all strata of life and would ordinarily not be of any concern. But, when a sapient life form has a high enough midichlorian count, they become self-aware of their unique abilities and can tap into the Force via the midichlorians. Within the setting of Star Wars, a sapient life form capable of utilizing the power of life is called a Force Sensitive, and it is an incredibly rare occurrence. For comparison, there are over a hundred quadrillion sapient life form in the Star Wars galaxy. Yet, as established in the Episode 1 Visual Dictionary, there were at most 10,000 active Jedi in the prequel movies, and therefore, only a hundred individuals have the potential to be force sensitive within each cycle. The exact reason why this trait appears at all is intentionally left unexplained. The central movies and extended lore hint that a genetic component is a significant variable to force sensitivity, but there is no conclusive answer. We cannot conduct scientific testing, and most in-universe research deem the study to be fruitless. What is known is that if a force sensitive were to have children, it is highly probable that their offspring would be force sensitive as well. Regardless of its source, midichlorians act as a conduit to the force, permitting force sensitives to use the force to perform what is functionally magic. And the higher one's midichlorian count, the greater their power. Individuals are either born force sensitive or they can never learn to tap into the force. Although, if a writer wishes it, a character can discover that they are force sensitive later in life. Establishing direct variables for an individual to use the force would create rigid parameters for storytelling, so there will never be a definitive answer as to the nature of midichlorians. The conditions leading to force sensitivity remain unexplained, random, yet also hereditary. The third axiom of Star Wars is that rare sapient life forms can become self-aware of their unique abilities and use the Force through the midichlorians. Force sensitives can strengthen their connection to the Force in two different ways. The first is by being calm, focusing one's mind through meditation and existing in the present. A Jedi's strength flows from the Force. But how am I to know the good side from the bad? You will know when you are calm. At peace. Passive. The second is by indulging in negative emotions such as anger, fear, and aggression. Acting on whims and losing your connection to life by being irrational, unfocused, and neurotic. But beware of the dark side. Anger, fear, aggression. The dark side force away. Easily they flow. Quick to join you in a fight. The Star Wars community classifies these usages as the light and dark side of the Force. However, these are not mere aspects of the Force, but rather the only possible methods of tapping into it. The light side is enlightenment, not an other side, but the totality of becoming one with all of life. And the dark side is a negative side effect of the Force that stems from forcefully drawing out life with your negative emotions through severing your attachments to its collective. By calming one's mind to reach inner peace, a Force Sensitive can become Zen, spreading their attachments to all of life and thereby become more capable in their use of the Force. Remember, a Jedi can feel the Force flowing through him. You mean it controls your actions? Partially, but it also obeys your commands. This time, let go your conscious self and act on instinct. Stretch out with your feelings. Alternatively, indulging in psychotic urges and acting irrationally on strong emotions such as anger, fear, and aggression 
lead one to forcefully draw out life itself, corrupting and twisting it for their usage. Through negative emotions, a force sensitive loses their relationship to life by focusing their minds on life destroying goals, forgetting their existence among the collective whole of life and having their psyche consumed by the desire of acquiring power. Are you going to kill me? I would certainly like to. I know you would. I can feel your anger. It gives you focus, makes you stronger. If once you start down the dark path, forever will it dominate your destiny, consume you at will. By using the Force negatively, over time, Force sensitives progressively lose their humanity and increasingly desire to hoard power for its own sake and rule everything. Degradation of physical appearance and one's pupils turning yellow are signs that an individual has become highly corrupted by the Force and is beyond redemption. The dark side of the Force is a metaphysical defense mechanism of the Force against any sapient life form that attempts to use the power of life to harm life itself. As a Force sensitive becomes stronger in the Force, they learn to use telekinesis like abilities. In general, there are three classifications of these Force powers light, universal, and dark. Light powers, such as Force Heal, always promote the growth of life. Neutral powers, such as Force Speed, benefit the body, but partially offensive abilities, such as Force Push, can either protect or harm. Dark powers, such as Force Choke, are harmful and only destroy life. Underlying each classification is their use case and intent, with the outcome of spreading life among the living force or damaging attachments to the cosmic force. If an individual uses Force Heal on a criminal and it leads to a further loss of life by that person, it is negative as it results in cosmic detachments. A force sensitive can use a universal force power such as force push for non-aggressive self-defensive purposes, but they can intentionally force push an innocent off a bridge to their death. An individual can use force lightning to torture someone, but also use similar powers to make a thematic point by causing a dead tree to burn. As there are innumerable contextual variables determining what echoes are ultimately life furthering or life severing, force sensitives cannot act mindlessly. They must be cautious of their usage of the force, only using it for knowledge and self-defense, never attack, or else they risk becoming agents of evil. Overall, force abilities are tied to the underlying intent and nonetheless still function under the fourth axiom of Star Wars. Using the force negatively is highly addictive and self-destructive like a drug. It makes an individual lose their humanity and volitional capacity until they become a shadow of who they once were. This corruptive effect of the Force is the unspoken rule by which the Jedi and Sith exist, and it echoes in their history. Upon the discovery of hyperdrive, most sapient species across the Star Wars galaxy came together to form the Republic. Equally, Force-sensitive individuals came together to build the Jedi Order. In both the old expanded universe and new Disney canon, certain Force sensitive recognized that they could tap into the Force negatively to increase their power. Ignoring the warnings, these individuals tapped into the dark side in secret and became addicted to the allure of acquiring more power, which led to the events referred to as the Hundred Year Darkness. After a long struggle, the corrupted Force sensitives were defeated and banished from the Jedi prompting them to form the Sith, vowing revenge. At last we will reveal ourselves to the Jedi. At last we will have revenge. This split between the Jedi and Sith outlines a dichotomy bound by the axiom of the negative side effects of the Force. The core of the Jedi philosophy is that using the Force negatively leads to the widespread destruction and oppression of all of life. The core of the Sith philosophy is that sapient life is ontologically superior and that everything ought to be used to further one's benefit, regardless of the personal cost of becoming corrupted by the Force. Returning to the analogy of a highly addictive drug, 
The philosophy of the Jedi is that of abstinence, while the philosophy of the Sith is that of absolute indulgence. A Jedi only learns light and universal powers for self-defensive purposes, classifying dark powers as forbidden since they lead to the corruption of the self and becoming addicted to the desire for more power. Alternatively, a Sith primarily focuses on dark side powers to harm and attack life, but they can expand their knowledge to all aspects of the Force to their benefit. Thematically, the Jedi represent the symbiosis and binding of all life and the balance between sapient life and nature, and the Sith represent the unbinding of life by desiring supremacy over all of life through the acquisition of power. By rebelling against life, the Sith create an oppressive environment for other living beings, and it is only upon their removal that life can flourish again. To restore the harmony among the living force, the Force manipulates the entire galaxy through the cosmic force to create the conditions for a Jedi to kill the Sith leader, thereby achieving balance. Within the Star Wars community, many misinterpret or misunderstand the concept of balance as a way to argue that the Jedi are of equal worth to the Sith or worse. The prophecy of the Chosen One foretold that Anakin would bring the end of the Sith and restore balance to the galaxy. However, people attempt to twist the structure of Star Wars by arguing that the word balance represents equilibrium between the Jedi and Sith in terms of their numbers. Many overly focus on Yoda, saying that the Jedi may have misinterpreted the prophecy as a way to argue that the existence and philosophy of the Jedi are wrong. They maintain that by siding with the Sith and eradicating the Jedi, Anakin achieved balance. But this is a rhetorical sleight of hand. Obi-Wan could not understand how joining the Sith and spreading destruction would lead to stopping the Sith. What the Jedi misinterpreted from the prophecy was how Anakin would achieve balance, not the meaning of balance as a whole. By the end of Return of the Jedi, Anakin fulfilled the prophecy by killing Palpatine and sacrificing his life to save his son. Luke was the only Jedi left standing, and that became a victory for all of life. The number of Jedi does not matter, because they are merely servants of the Force, and so long as one Jedi rebels against the oppression of the Sith and wins, life can be brought back into a state of harmony. Ultimately, the foundations of balance are the meta-narrative that bind the entire Star Wars canon, and this is the final axiom of Star Wars. Good is maintaining and restoring the symbiosis between sapient life and the rest of life, while evil is the rebellion of sapient life against all of life. Underlying the core of the meta-narrative is that, after great sacrifice, good always wins in the end, but evil always returns because sapient life always has the potential to rebel against nature. The five axioms that underline the entire structure of Star Wars are interconnected and metaphysical within its setting. There can never be any equilibrium between good and evil. Symbiosis cannot exist alongside those that desire to oppress all of life. This perpetual war between both sides is explicitly spelled out by Palpatine and Yoda. We must move quickly. The Jedi are relentless. If they are not all destroyed, it will be civil war without end. Destroy the Sith. We must. So, to summarize, these are the five axioms of Star Wars. The Force binds all life together, creating a symbiotic relationship with the midichlorians. Sapient life form can focus their consciousness allowing them to control and reshape reality for their self-interest and to thrive. Rare individuals can tap into the Force via the midichlorians to use magic-like powers. Using the Force negatively corrupts like a drug, leaving Force sensitives addicted to acquiring power for its own sake and making them desire to rule all of life. The Force manipulates the entire galaxy to restore the symbiotic relationship by creating the conditions that lead to the Jedi to kill the Sith and achieve balance. Altogether, the five axioms create an eternal recurrence between the dichotomy of the preservation of symbiosis 
and the rebellion of sapience against all of life. It is a perpetual cycle. There are moments of peace, but the cycle begins anew each time a sapient with a high midichlorian count becomes corrupted by the desire of more power for its own sake, seeking to rule and oppress other life. Restoring balance comes at a high cost, leading millions to die every cycle. But from the point of view of the collective whole of life, it is the price to pay for freedom and harmony. The Last Jedi Visual Dictionary acknowledged this as a fact, saying, Luke's studies revealed the cyclical nature of the struggle between light and dark, and the massive toll the galaxy pays each cycle. As a result, many within the Star Wars community noticed that this perpetual war between the Jedi and Sith is a never-ending spiral of death. They feel that the structure of Star Wars as a whole ought to change or that perhaps the Jedi should change their philosophy to accommodate emotions and attachments, as they are an essential part of being human. Bluntly, rather than accept Star Wars for what it truly is, many are vocal in their demands that the franchise should change to convey new stories beyond the parameters of its axioms. This perspective has led many to the cry that the Jedi must be wrong. The truth is that the Jedi have structured their entire philosophy based on the existence of those five axioms. And the most important one that underlies their philosophy is that using the Force negatively inherently corrupts. It is an absolute that cannot be cheated and forces the Jedi to be overly cautious in their teachings. Within Republic space, the Jedi monitor all sapient life and gather Force-sensitive children at a young age training them in the Jedi ways. He deserves better than a slave's life. Had he been born in the Republic, we would have identified him earlier. From a certain point of view, seizing children may be seen as draconian or creepy, but it prevents a Force-sensitive from forming any selfish attachments to the material world rather than to all of life. It must be difficult having sworn your love to the Jedi, not being able to visit the places you like or do the things you like. I'll be with the people that I love. Are you allowed to love? Thought that was forbidden for a Jedi. Attachment is forbidden. Possession is forbidden. Compassion, which I would define as unconditional love, is central to a Jedi's life. In the context of Star Wars, Unconditional love does not mean to romantically love with such intensity that it feels unconditional, but to love everyone equally, without any personal preferences. This rejection of selfish attachments is not done maliciously, but to prevent the fear of loss. When a sapient is born, their first attachment is with their parents, given to them by love. Once a child grows up, they come to understand that attachments can be severed and that they ought to take life seriously because there is always a risk that it can end. Adulthood properly begins once an individual resolves to coexist with reality and flourish while alive, because they accept that they too can die and therefore, life should be experienced to its maximum potential. If an individual is unable to accept the metaphysical conditions of reality, seeking to have their whims enforced upon reality they realize that some events are beyond one's control, creating both a sense of anxiety and a desire for power. In Star Wars, if a Force sensitive has attachments and faces anxiety, they can act irrationally and use the Force negatively as a quick and easy way to maintain control over reality with functionally magical powers, which leads to becoming corrupted by the desire for more power. The existence of anxiety becomes an enormous risk factor for the entirety of the galaxy, as a force sensitive can begin to desire to rule all of life to control all aspects of reality, so as to never face any anxiety. A force sensitive may have rational, personal motives to utilize the force to harm life to their benefit. Nevertheless, once corrupted, they become addicted and irrationally begin to believe that they can do anything. Once a Force Sensitive reaches this point, they attempt to overthrow the Republic so as to rule all of life. As a result, within Republic space, 
The Jedi separate children with a high midichlorian count from their parents before they form any attachments. If a child were to retain memories or attachments to their parents, they become much more likely to use the Force negatively. So obtaining Force sensitive before that point is of absolute importance for the Jedi Order. In Phantom Menace, Anakin had already formed attachments to his mother and was afraid of never seeing her again. After finding and losing her, he acted out in anger, killing the Sand People. This type of negative emotional outburst is what the Jedi fear the most when training those that are too old. And in Return of the Jedi, the same fear is shown when Vader threatens Luke with turning his sister. Sister. So, you have a twin sister. If you will not turn to the dark side, then perhaps she will. To be angry is to be human. I'm a Jedi. I know I'm better than this. A Force-sensitive does not have the luxury to be human. They must maintain their duty to life and remain focused on the present, or else they risk becoming irrational, unfocused, and neurotic. To be a Jedi, one must be devoted to letting go of all personal attachments to the material world, locking away their potential by progressively losing their ego and becoming Zen to mitigate the risk of embracing the dark side. The purpose of the Jedi is the responsibility to act selflessly as a primary duty for the collective whole of life, without any consideration for personal choices or preferences. In Attack of the Clones, Anakin has a line that echoes the essence of his Jedi training. Sometimes we must let go of our pride and do what is requested of us. Near the end of the movie, as Anakin and Obi-Wan are pursuing Dooku, Padme falls from the gunship and Anakin has to choose between chasing Dooku or saving Padme. Over the ship! I can't take Dooku alone! I need you! If we catch him, we can end this war right now! We have a job to do! I don't care! Put the ship down! You will be expelled from the Jedi Order! I can't leave her! Come to your senses! What do you think Padme would do with she in your position? She would do her duty. Anakin feared losing Padme, but when he calmed his mind, thinking of what she would do, he accepted his duty. In spite of his reluctance, Anakin's acceptance to follow his duty displays the proper function of a Jedi. From a humanistic point of view, these teachings are inhumane, but it prevents Force-sensitive from becoming corrupted by their anxiety and irrationality. The Jedi Order is an establishment that exists to train Force-sensitives to uphold the symbiosis of life by not having any personal attachments. Once they reach absolute enlightenment, they become a Jedi Master and train the next generation to do the same until their death. For the rest of the galaxy, this self-containment is a lesser of evils when the alternative is the significant possibility of a Force-sensitive violently ceasing power, leading an armada so as to oppress the entirety of life. This endpoint is such a risk that the Jedi take their duty and roles to be of utmost importance and refuse to train children over a certain age, for fear that having personal attachments leads to becoming an agent of evil. Although Qui-Gon deemed Anakin the Chosen One, the Jedi Council was reluctant to train him because they could sense that he had already formed attachments with his mother and feared losing her. See through you. We can. Be mindful of your feelings. Your thoughts dwell on your mother. I miss her. Mm. Afraid to lose her, I think. Mm? What does that got to do with anything? Everything. Fear is the path to the dark side. I sense much fear in you. He is to be trained then? No. He will not be trained. He is too old. The only reason Anakin became a Jedi was because it was Qui-Gon's dying wish, and the Jedi were willing to bend the rules, understanding that Anakin would always be at risk of falling. In Attack of the Clones, Anakin had great power but lacked focus, always acting on emotion. The Jedi Council hadn't judged whether Anakin was ready to become a full Jedi, and Yoda could feel his pain while losing his mother. 
But when Anakin was given a choice as to whether he would continue to pursue Dooku or save Padme, Anakin chose to follow his duty. Right after Anakin made his choice, we see Yoda in deep thought. Arguably, Yoda was observing whether Anakin could be a Jedi by following his duty rather than acting irrationally. This action likely assured the Jedi Council that Anakin could be a proper Jedi. However, in Revenge of the Sith, Anakin began to see dreams of Padme's death and came to understand this future as a certainty. Upon facing this inevitability, he went to see Yoda and was given the only proper advice. Accept death. These visions you have. They're of death. Close to you? Yes. Careful you must be when sensing the future, Anakin. The fear of loss is a path to the dark side. I won't let these visions come true, Master Yoda. Death is a natural part of life. Rejoice for those around you who transform into the Force. Mourn them do not. Miss them do not. Attachment leads to jealousy. The shadow of greed, that is. What must I do, Master Yoda? Train yourself to let go of everything you fear to lose. Anakin had to accept that he could not control all aspects of life, that no power can circumvent the ultimate equalizer, death. But Anakin could not let go. He refused to accept that consciousness is bound to end, and that fact is beyond one's control. Become my apprentice. Learn to use the dark side of the Force. I will do whatever you ask. Just help me save Padme's life. I can't live without her. The refusal to accept death, either of oneself or others, is the most direct path to the dark side. And the main reason why the Jedi teach against forming personal attachments. Ontologically, sapient life forms are capable of focusing their minds, conceptualizing reality to a higher degree for their benefit, and can gain a significant advantage over the rest of life. This cognitive ability can lead individuals to believe that by reshaping and exerting control over reality, sapient life is above reality in all manners, and that with enough effort, their awareness and enjoyment of life can be everlasting. However, death is the ultimate reminder that sapient life is not metaphysically superior to life, but is forever bound to it. To be self-aware of one's death does not prevent it from happening. The unconscious desire of all sapients is to unlock the secrets of life and twist it in such a way as to be free of the metaphysical limitations imposed on itself and live forever. The Jedi teach that death is to be celebrated and is a natural part of life. But since Force sensitives are capable of utilizing the power of life itself, some mistakenly believe that they can control the mechanisms of life and cheat death. To cheat death is a power only one has achieved. But if we work together, I know we can discover the Jedi maintain that it is only by accepting the metaphysical limits imposed by reality that life can flourish. And while the Sith are unable to become immortal and overcome every limitation of life, they achieve the second best thing by becoming the rulers of all of life, spreading an atmosphere of oppression and causing widespread death. As a result, acting as servants of the Force and all of life, the Jedi cannot allow the Sith to oppress everything and everyone, and must seek to end their tyranny. And the Sith, rebelling against all of life, actively confront the Jedi to impose their will on the galaxy, spreading death. The ultimate embodiment of the Sith philosophy is the creation of a weapon of mass destruction, capable of eradicating life on an unprecedented scale. It is not that the Republic does not have the means to create such super weapons, but that symbiosis does not need to rebel against life because it mutually cooperates with the rest of life. 
The tension between the growth of life and the spread of death is unresolvable. The Jedi are the only valid option because the metaphysical axioms of the setting actively negate all attempts by sapient life that seek to transcend life itself through physical and spiritual corruption, and eventually manipulating the entire galaxy to end their life. Alternatively, as the Sith represent the rebellion against life, they ultimately repeat their desire to achieve supremacy and the destruction of such superweapons becomes thematically tied with the death of the oppressive Sith leader. Balance is not merely the systematic requirement of the setting, but the thematic crux upon which Star Wars conveys its values. This tension locks the events of Star Wars in an eternal recurrence, where the same events keep repeating over and over and over, even if the particulars of reaching balance differ between each cycle. Although characterized as plain evil, people are drawn to the allure of the Sith because to be human is to also unconsciously desire to overcome the limitations of life and achieve immortality. And while the Jedi are heroes that serve the collective whole of life, they teach to deny selfish attachments and suppress emotions, which is antithetical to human nature. By wanting to unconsciously side with the Sith, yet feeling repulsed by having to choose the Jedi, the Star Wars community perceives both factions as nihilistic and yearn for the perpetual wars to reach an end. But that will never happen due to the foundations of Star Wars that metaphysically encompass the very essence of what it means to be human. The Jedi and Sith do not merely represent extremes out of choice, but by evolutionary necessity in response to the five axioms. On the internet, people readily cry out that a potential solution to the cyclical wars between the Jedi and Sith is the Grey Jedi. Due to general misconceptions associated with the Jedi and a lack of understanding of the axioms of Star Wars, there has never been a conclusive categorization of what it means to be a Grey Jedi. In the book, The Jedi Path, a manual for students of the Force, there is a mention that a Grey Jedi is a maverick Jedi. It is typically used as the source to describe what the Grey Jedi are, but it does not fully answer the core question of what that means within the context of Star Wars. I attempted to explain the Grey Jedi in my video on that topic while giving criticisms for their existence, but many came to the misunderstanding that all Grey Jedi are apathetic, which is incorrect and requires further clarification. At its core, a Grey Jedi is a Force-sensitive taught in the Jedi ways that does not conform rigidly to the teachings and duties of being a Jedi. The Jedi maintain symbiosis and harmony with the rest of life according to five directives. Train Force sensitives at a young age to be selfless and never form any personal attachments. Only use light and universal powers for self-defensive purposes. Act as peacekeepers for the Republic and leaders of their armies in wartime. Never kill unarmed prisoners. Kill all Sith to restore balance. If a Force-sensitive forms attachments with their family or romantically fall in love, they automatically become a Grey Jedi. Anakin had attachments with his mother and loved Padme, and he ultimately fell to the allure of cheating death. Luke formed ties with his aunt and uncle, and later with his sister, and almost fell while being baited by Vader, but was able to calm his mind and let go of his hatred after noticing that he was becoming corrupted like his father. With great effort, a Force-sensitive that has formed familial bonds can still follow the duties of a Jedi, but they are prone to emotions and are at a higher risk of using the Force negatively compared to a traditional Jedi. A common misconception on the internet is that a Grey Jedi is a Force-sensitive that is able or willing to use all aspects of the Force, both light and dark without falling into the extreme disassociation of the Jedi by being selfless and zen, or that of the Sith by being purely rebellious against the rest of life, driven by the desire of power for its own sake. However, there is no such thing as using both sides of the Force in a state of self-mastered balance as it violates the fourth axiom that using the Force negatively corrupts. There is no middle ground between abstinence and indulgence in the context of such a highly addictive drug. Becoming stronger in the Force 
comes at the cost of either ego death to be in tune with all of life or indulging in negative emotions such as anger, fear and aggression, acting on whims and losing one's attachments to life. If a force sensitive could circumvent the fourth axiom and use all aspects of the force without being corrupted, such an entity or teaching would make both the Jedi and Sith ideologically redundant. The Jedi have structured their entire order under the notion that using the force negatively comes with consequences, and thus to be selfless and to forbid the use of dark powers is an absolute for the sake of all life in the galaxy. By being able to use all aspects of the force, including powers that harm life, such an entity would be a better version of the Sith by not becoming corrupted by the desire for more power. If a character or group were to cheat the axioms of using the force negatively without becoming corrupted, the meta-narrative that binds the entire setting would collapse, and Star Wars as a whole would cease to thematically function. This misconception of the Grey Jedi is often a wish-fulfillment fantasy by those that desire to supersede the fact that using the force negatively to harm life comes with consequences. They crave to be a Sith without paying the price. The Grey Jedi are not a synthesis of the Jedi and Sith, nor a true servant of the Force by seeking to maintain equilibrium between both factions. Nor are they able to use any dark powers without experiencing psychological corruption. They are merely unorthodox Jedi that do not conform rigidly to the teachings and duties of the Jedi Order. But this begs the question, what about Qui-Gon and Mace Windu? Are they not great Jedi? They are indeed unorthodox Jedi, but only insofar as acting independently of the Jedi philosophy and bending the Jedi code. Qui-Gon acted in open defiance of the Jedi Council, while following his duties of maintaining the peace in the galaxy. Do not defy the Council Master, not again. I shall do what I must, Obi-Wan. When he obtains an audience with the Jedi Council, Qui-Gon trusts his independent judgment, declaring that Anakin is the chosen one and then considers disregarding the Jedi Code by saying that he will train him. He is the chosen one. You must see it. I take Anakin as my Padawan learner. An apprentice? You have, Qui-Gon. Impossible to take out a second. The Code forbids it. Qui-Gon, sir. I don't want to be a problem. You won't be any. I'm not allowed to train you, so I want you to watch me and be mindful. Such disagreements leads one to take a humane perspective and become great. If a Jedi chooses to act independently, yet nonetheless operate within their mandate, they are merely tolerated so long as they teach the next generation to be selfless, remain focused on the present, and follow their duties. If a Force-sensitive desires to enact change beyond merely upholding the symbiosis, they become a grey Sith. Qui-Gon Jinn would never join you. Don't be so sure, my young Jedi. I hinted at their existence at the end of my grey Jedi video, but I omitted any detailed explanation. A grey Sith is a Force sensitive that has left the Jedi Order after recognizing that the Jedi only act as peacekeepers and joins the Sith to enact social change. Unlike the Sith that preach absolute indulgence in utilizing all aspects of the Force to acquire power without limit, the Grey Sith remain rational by limiting their usage of dark powers to enact growth, only attacking when absolutely necessary. Count Dooku is the prime candidate, as he desired to change the static nature of the Republic and became the de facto leader of the Confederacy of Independent Systems. However, their failure is that they align themselves with the Sith to enact change. While the Grey Sith are willing to utilize power to further goals, the Sith as a whole only seek to acquire more power for its own sake, and this inevitably leads to betrayal. All those that become Grey Sith are doomed to never enact the social change they desire to accomplish. As for Mace Windu, he was a Jedi that followed his duties but broke the Jedi Code for pragmatic reasons. One of the rules of the Jedi is that they must not kill unarmed prisoners. They can only kill in self-defense, never initiating an attack, or else they become corrupted. A Jedi uses the Force 
for knowledge and defense, never for attack. If an individual seeks to attack with the intention of murder, the Jedi can kill them because they have chosen to violate the symbiosis that unites all of life. Once an individual has surrendered, a Jedi cannot bring them harm, as they must maintain attachments among all life through the cosmic force. In Revenge of the Sith, Anakin disarmed Dooku and held his life in his hands, having to decide whether he should follow the Jedi way by sparing his life or indulging in neurotic gratification by killing him, thematically conveyed by having Anakin hold both the blue and red lightsaber. After killing Dooku, Anakin confirms that this was wrong and against the Jedi Code. He was too dangerous to be kept alive. Yes, but he was an unarmed prisoner. I shouldn't have done that. It's not the Jedi way. This affirmation is a clue to the audience that this is an absolute. Later in the movie, Windu defeats Palpatine and is given the same choice. But Anakin is there to remind him of the Jedi Code. I am going to end this once and for all. You can't. He must stand trial. He has control of the Senate and the courts. He's too dangerous to be left alive. It's not the Jedi way. He must live. In our world, one can make the pragmatic argument that killing Palpatine would save the galaxy by ending future Sith oppression. However, within the universe of Star Wars, the severing of life outside of self-defense goes against symbiosis. We can be confident that Windu knows that killing Palpatine is wrong because he grimaces before deciding to strike. Never for attack. Windu is a grey Jedi that was willing to violate the symbiosis so as to achieve an everlasting peace. If he had simply followed the Jedi Code and maintained the separation between the Republic and Jedi Order by bringing Palpatine to face trial, Anakin would not have acted irrationally and cut his arm off. If a force sensitive is to bend the rules or exist beyond the parameters of promoting life and maintain symbiosis, it results in personal and cosmic consequences. The Star Wars setting creates polarizing conditions that push for the extremes of the Jedi and Sith, and those that do not conform to the Jedi teachings have a high potential to harm the totality of life. The only alternative is when a force sensitive runs away. Such individuals are what I categorize as apathetic Jedi. Beyond the responsibility of training the next generation of force sensitive, the most crucial role of a Jedi is to kill the Sith to maintain harmony between sapiens and all of life. If a Jedi refuses to uphold their duty to the collective whole of life by fighting evil, either after becoming disillusioned with the Jedi Order or experiencing personal failure, they become apathetic. For example, Yoda in the original trilogy is an apathetic Jedi. After losing almost every Jedi he trained, he fought Palpatine and lost, and never again fought the Sith directly. Into exile, I must go. Failed, I have. To exile oneself from the struggles of life is moral cowardice. It is a refusal to uphold that which promotes living and the coexistence between life and reality because it is good, and a more resignation from having to confront that which oppresses life from flourishing because it is evil. Although Yoda agrees to train Luke, he only does so following Obi-Wan's request. An apathetic Jedi may act to restore balance or otherwise contribute to upholding the symbiosis. But so long as they remain in exile, cowardly refusing to wholly devote themselves to their duties by fighting evil, they remain categorically apathetic. So, to summarize, these are the positions of a Force-sensitive in the Star Wars setting. An Orthodox Jedi, trained at a young age before having formed any attachments with their parents, who never romantically falls in love and upholds the symbiosis across the galaxy. An unorthodox Jedi that has formed attachments with their parents or romantically falls in love. An orthodox maverick Jedi that trusts their independent judgment yet nonetheless follow their Jedi duties. An orthodox pragmatic Jedi 
that is willing to violate the symbiosis. An apathetic Jedi that lives as a rock, doing nothing, waiting to die. An unorthodox Sith that limits their negative usage of the Force to enact social change. An orthodox Sith that desires power for its own sake and to rule all of life. These seven categorizations are the only possibilities within the Star Wars setting that are consistent with the five axioms. From a certain point of view, the number of Force sensitives in the galaxy make up an incredibly small percentage of the total population and ought not to matter in the grand scheme of things. However, due to the axioms that bind Star Wars, they spread out and shape the power structure of the entire galaxy. The political dynamic of Star Wars is an extension of the sapient spectrum of choice that echoes the position permitted to Force sensitives within the parameters of the axioms. The Galactic Republic, representing civilization as a whole, is an interplanetary democratic constitutional republic that ensures the free movement of people, goods, services, and capital within the internal market, and upholds individual rights and protection to all. It is bound by a bureaucratic court of law, with elected officials of planetary systems that come together to unanimously vote on political actions for mutual benefit. The Republic is the most beneficial system of governance because it considers the perspective of all and maintains consent as an absolute. We need a system where the politicians sit down and discuss the problem, agree what's in the best interest of all the people, and then do it. That's exactly what we do. The, the trouble is that people don't always agree. In Star Wars, democracy is not merely a political system through which the majority of the population rules, but one where all elected officials of the Senate that represent sapient life must mutually agree on all policies to prevent the misuse of power. As such, with political egalitarianism, the Republic becomes an institutional representation of symbiosis for sapient life to flourish ideally benefiting all species equally. This union is thematically echoed in Phantom Menace when Obi-Wan mentions the relationship between Naboo and the Gungans. Once those droids take control of the surface, they will take control of you. You and the Naboo form a symbiont circle. What happens to one of you will affect the other. You must understand this. By representing all of life, the Republic maintains a state of harmony within civilization that promotes peace and prosperity. And to preserve the symbiosis, the Jedi act as peacekeepers of the Republic and democracy, helping behind the scenes and advising the Chancellor directly. From a certain point of view, it would seem that the Jedi are the ones that serve the Republic. But through mutual cooperation, the Republic can also act as an institution that exists to protect the Jedi. The general duties of a Jedi are to prevent Force sensitives from becoming corrupted and to stop the Sith from oppressing all of life. When the Sith are not a threat, the Jedi remain in the background, only intervening in ways such as mediating treaties or trade agreements. But when the Sith eventually re-attempt to eradicate the Republic, they understand that their true opponents are the Jedi, since they alone have the potential to challenge their rule. Individually and as a group, the Jedi are not an effective fighting force. Overwhelming numbers can kill them. As such, the Republic exists as a shell to protect the Jedi until they eventually reach the leader of the Sith army and defeat them. The emphasis on four sensitives resolving the conflict that determines the political dynamic of the setting is the reason the Jedi and Sith are thematically more important than non-Force sensitives that sacrifice themselves in larger conflicts. The Jedi must exist as figureheads and spearheads of all of life until they single-handedly end the rulers that rebel against life and restore harmony. When the Sith become powerful again by either challenging or overthrowing the Republic, they promote a system of military dictatorship with a political structure that does not recognize consent or uphold individual rights. Where the higher ones rank within the hierarchy, the greater their power. Within such a hierarchical system, those with power negate consent through dominance by making others agree with their decisions, even if it goes against their interest or self-preservation. The, the trouble is that people don't always agree. 
Well, then they should be made to. By whom? Who's gonna make them? I don't know. Someone. Sounds an awful lot like a dictatorship to me. At the top, the most powerful corrupted force sensitive reigns supreme, ruling everything. Through fear and coercive force, the Sith prevent life from flourishing and maintain an atmosphere of oppression across the galaxy, even within their ranks. A force sensitive has the greatest relationship to power because the force is the power of life itself and the ultimate means of power as it exists beyond the material world. By subjugating lieutenants through the force and inspiring fear, a force sensitive maintains their control and continues their oppression so long as they are alive. And at the bottom, grunt soldiers spread the oppression against all of life as the tentacles of evil. So long as the leaders of evil exist, oppression can be rebuilt and life cannot flourish. While the political dynamic between the Republic and Sith Empire can change hands and influence the entire galaxy, the dichotomy between symbiosis and the rebellion of sapiens against life make it so that only these two political systems become the standard within the galaxy. However, there is a third alternative that attaches itself to the Republic and the Sith, acting semi-independently of both. Capitalism. At its core, capitalism is the political economic system where private individuals own property and are free to use or dispose of it as they see fit, to an unlimited degree. Republic law upholds the recognition of individual rights and property rights in which ownership of property is private, allowing sapient beings to trade with consent to profit and flourish. But outside of Republic space, Star Wars portrays capitalism as unreliable and oppressive to life and sapience, as evidenced with the existence of slavery. My mother. Ah, uh, she's not mine no more. I sold her. You sold her? Sorry, Annie, but you know business is business, huh? <laughs> I can't believe there's still slavery in the galaxy. The Republic's anti-slavery laws are... The Republic doesn't exist out here. On these unlawful worlds, anarchy and chaos reigns, and individuals in power can do whatever they desire, driven by greed and the acquisition of material wealth. Bounty hunters, assassins, gangsters, pirates, and other assorted criminals all exist for their self-interest, without any regards to the rest of life. Money, a tool for exchanging goods and services, is a symbol of greed that perpetually binds individuals to their self-interest and permits delayed consumption that buys time for future goals, rather than promote the symbiosis among all of life. I expect to be well paid. I'm in it for the money. You needn't worry about your reward. If money is all that you love, then that's what you'll receive. Your friend is quite a mercenary. I wonder if he really cares about anything or anybody. So, you got your reward and you're just leaving then? That's right, yeah. Good reward if you ain't around to use it. Well, take care of yourself, huh? But I guess that's what you're best at, isn't it? By being linked to selfishness, it has a widespread impact on sapiens and maintains a corruptive influence on democracy itself. It is my experience that senators focus only on pleasing those who fund their campaigns, and they're in no means scared of forgetting the niceties of democracy in order to get those funds. As a result, the Republic systematically keeps capitalism in check through law and prevents individuals from accumulating wealth by benefiting all sapien beings with taxation. In the prequel movies, the Trade Federation sides with the Sith to cheat the system and expand their profits, acting to sever their ties to the Republic and starting a civil war by convincing other planetary systems to secede. Considering taxation to be theft, they form the Confederacy of Independent Systems in union with other like-minded powers and organizations to separate themselves from the Republic. But, unfortunately, similar to the Great Sith, they can never achieve anything because aligning oneself with those that seek to oppose symbiosis invariably leads to betrayal. Thematically evoked by their mechanical droid army, the CIS represent the desires of capitalism to be independent and free of their obligations to others by enacting a social change. It is no coincidence that Dooku is the leader of the Confederacy of Independent Systems, 
and every associated leader experiences the same degree of betrayal. Capitalism always seeks to promote its self-interest, and its mistake is when it ties itself to like-minded selfishness with power that only offers short-sighted gains and control. Individuals believe that they can avoid the negative consequences of ignoring symbiosis for personal profit. But consent is impossible with the Sith. In Empire Strikes Back, Cloud City acts as an independent haven of capitalism that flourishes on its own. When the Empire shows up to capture Han, Lando begrudgingly betrays his friend for his self-preservation and that of the city, and makes a deal with Vader. Such actions display the weakness of capitalism. Trade requires rational, mutual agreement between two parties. But those that have power can nullify consent for their benefit via the threat of coercive force. Calrissian, take the princess and the Wookiee to my ship. You said they'd be left in the city under my supervision. I am altering the deal. Pray I don't alter it any further. Once capitalism recognizes that it too can be oppressed, it accepts that it has no choice but to side with symbiosis, even if too late. The realization that Star Wars is politically and systematically rigid is not coincidental, but the progressional intent bound by the axioms of the setting. It does not restrict the possibilities of new stories, but everything ties back to symbiosis to maintain the status quo. The rigidity is a manifestation of the tension between the metaphysical laws of reality and the nature of what it means to be human. Explaining this tension between the two is the core purpose of art, and Star Wars becomes a retelling of mythologies by emphasizing this tension as its thematic and narrative drive. Beyond the setting taking place in space, Star Wars maintains a degree of realism where material resources are scarce and reality is metaphysically bound by the law of identity, but it also includes midichlorians that mystically act as a systematic binding of all life to itself. By having specific sapient individuals with a higher midichlorian count, it becomes a narrative means for individuals to be touched by God as a way to represent their extraordinary abilities beyond what is typical. Star Wars emphasizes that these chosen few can single-handedly reshape society by their will and ability alone. In our world, this is comparable with figures such as Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Gaius Octavian, and Napoleon Bonaparte that become the parallels to the warnings of the potential of great individuals to rise and structure the world to their whims and seek to rule everything. The cyclical history and political structure of Star Wars are but the bibliography of great individuals that adhere to the great man theory in which those that are special can single-handedly set the course of history itself. By placing narrative focus on individuals with a high midichlorian count and their actions, Star Wars emphasizes warfare to dramatize the tension between the metaphysical rules of reality and what it means to be human. The source of the perpetual conflicts in Star Wars exists alongside the thematic dichotomy between nature and technology. Ontologically, sapient life forms have the cognitive ability to grasp and utilize reality with science. The systemization of nature by integrating and acquiring knowledge via observations and non-contradictory conclusions. And it allows us to flourish in the present and future. Technology is the application of science. And whether its use is good or evil depends on the intent of its creation, whether it makes life and reality mutually shine, or whether it negates coexistence. When technology is only used to destroy life, it inspires oppression and fear through death. In Star Wars, abominations of science include the Death Star and its variations, which exist to destroy life on a massive scale and the droid factories on Geonosis that perpetuate the tools of warfare and conflict. The dichotomy between technology that exists alongside the rest of life or acts against it lies at the heart of sapience. In essence, sapient life forms are beings of volitional consciousness. They are animals with the cognitive power to focus their minds and can act rationally by making logical, non-contradictory conclusions from the facts of life. 
conceptualizing to a higher degree for their benefit to flourish in coexistence with reality. The source of separation between rational animals and the rest of life is our intelligence. At its core, intelligence is the ability to grasp the facts of reality and conceptually deal in the long range. By abstracting nature and being able to hold five or six concepts in our minds, sapient individuals can live beyond the present to control the future. This degree of conceptualization is superior to other animals that can generally only live for their base desires in the present and have no self-awareness. However, intelligence has a drawback. The inability to fully control the future according to one's wishes or expectations can lead to the feeling of cognitive pain, known as anxiety. It is the fear of the impossibility to control perceived outcomes. When an individual is unable or unwilling to accept facts of life or unavoidable aspects of reality, it leads to a feeling of ontological helplessness and induced irrationality. A sensation of dread emerges that it is impossible to coexist with reality because it does not adhere to one's wishes. Mentally blanking out the fact that we are not above reality, able to do anything like a god. In essence, God is a consciousness capable of absolutely manipulating causality by being a manifestation and negation to the law of identity, able to control all aspects of reality according to one's whims. It is a projection of our volitional consciousness applied to the totality of reality. The unconscious desire for immortality by sapiens is a proxy for our actual desires of omnipotence. To be all-powerful and do anything and everything, to an unlimited degree. Although sapient life is unable to transcend reality and control its totality, an individual can utilize coercive force, negating consent and violating individual rights, triggering a psychological exhilaration and intense euphoria that momentarily quenches all anxieties. In Star Wars, this euphoric gratification becomes metaphysical and a representation of corruption when Force sensitives negatively use the power of life to harm life itself, and the euphoria becomes a literal addiction to the desire of power for its own sake. While those without a high midichlorian count do not feel this intoxication and corruption on the same level as Force sensitives, the potential lies within each individual's that can rebel against reality and violate consent to obtain power and prevent change. The endpoint of corrupted sapient life with a high midichlorian count is Palpatine in Return of the Jedi, ruling above all else, able to do anything on his throne, controlling everything according to his whims. By always having the potential to rebel against the rest of life and desire to rule above it, Humans and other sapient beings become a living contradiction to nature. The very existence of sapiens creates a paradox between itself and nature, originating by our ability to conceptualize and systematically rearrange materials with science. Yet, never being able to transcend it to obtain absolute power. Thematically representing all of nature, the Gungan leader addresses the source of this contradiction. We shall no like the Nabu. The Nabu think they so smarty. They think they brain so big. And by the end of Phantom Menace, Padme bows down to the Gungan leader, signifying how sapient life must accept that they are bound to nature. Star Wars argues that sapient beings must accept that there are some things that are beyond our control because they are metaphysical, and we do not exist above the structures of reality. There's little hope she's lasted this long. Where are you going? To find my mother. Your mother's dead, son. Accept it. The shifter broke. Life seems so much simpler when you're fixing things. I'm good at fixing things. Always was. Why'd she have to die? Why couldn't I save her? I know I could have. Sometimes there are things no one can fix. In essence, 
The reason sapience desires power is to prevent the cognitive pain of realizing that we do not have absolute control over reality and that we will experience change and loss, regardless of our desires. I don't want things to change. But you can't stop the change any more than you can stop the suns from setting. But by being at odds with the metaphysics of reality, a sapient being mentally unbinds itself from the rest of life, needing to continually sacrifice the present in an attempt to never experience any anxiety in the future. Don't center on your anxieties, Obi-Wan. Keep your concentration here and now where it belongs. But Master Yoda said I should be mindful of the future. But not at the expense of the moment. While intelligence is a double-edged sword, Star Wars proposes a plausible solution. Jar Jar Binks. Isa, Your Highness? Yes. The problem with Sapience is that it has the potential to control the future by sacrificing the present with power as a means to prevent anxieties. But if a sapient being is of lower intelligence, it can partially function without having to worry about anything, including one's life. Oh, Mui, Mui, I love you! You almost got us killed. Are you brainless? I speak! The ability to speak does not make you intelligent. In Phantom Menace, Jar Jar is clumsy, always in need of help, and nearly incapable of seeing the consequences of his actions. Yet, everything he does is ultimately beneficial and has a way of resulting in positive outcomes. In short, Jar Jar is always living in the present because he lacks the intelligence to know any better and is incapable of planning long term. The Star Wars community mistakenly believe that Jar Jar only existed to please children, and while there might be some truth to this claim, they fail to grasp that he is THE thematic embodiment of Star Wars. Because, within the context of the setting, having intelligence is the original sin that creates widespread destruction and war. By arguing that he has no purpose, people miss the thematic point of intelligence being the curse of sapience, and that stupidity keeps individuals from the acquisition of power on account of them not having any self-awareness or being able to perceive far into the future. His idiocy limits his desires and volition without him ever facing any anxiety by always living in the present. But lacking intelligence also has its limitations. In Attack of the Clones, Jar Jar became the political representative of Naboo. And when a crisis came about, he lacked the foresight to recognize that giving authoritative power goes against the foundations of democracy, which eventually led to the destruction of the Republic. Stupidity has no role in politics and civilization, and its existence is not enough to prevent an individual with high intelligence and ability from potentially desiring power and rule all of life. Star Wars internally corrects the tension between sapience and nature by turning the nature of sapience against itself, targeting the fact that to be able to conceptualize and live in the long term requires an epistemological and moral framework by which one can be self-aware of their actions and guide their life alongside the metaphysics of nature. By the very nature of sapience, such life is conscious of reality and has the cognitive ability to choose what is important in life, then acts to gain and keep them, given a sense of meaning and direction in the form of values. Whether one decides to live according to life-affirming or life-denying values depends on whether they accept that they can properly coexist with reality by committing the full focus of their minds to remain rational and adhere to non-contradictory conclusions from the facts of life. The potential risk of sapience is that individuals can establish incorrect contradictory conclusions and premises, which creates a mental disconnection between one's consciousness and the metaphysics of reality. When a sapient continually fails to acquire values or experiences an inability to maintain attachments, refusing to refocus their minds to form non-contradictory perspectives, they feel neurotic, lash out, and begin to resent the totality of life, 
by refusing to accept that their perceived goals do not match with what is possible within the metaphysical structures of nature, and thus choose to rebel and destroy. Therefore, if an individual desires to continually experience the joys of life and mitigate the potential of becoming disconnected from reality, it must perpetually choose to adhere to the facts of life and act rationally to flourish properly. However, in spite of grounding its universe somewhat realistically, the Star Wars setting corrupts coexistence with the metaphysics of reality by mystically demanding that all sapient beings must be subservient to nature. Rather than accepting non-contradictory perspectives by adhering with the law of identity, coexisting with reality becomes interchangeable with servitude to the collective whole of life, as symbiosis and nature are metaphysically one and the same. By the existence of the midichlorians that binds all life together, each individual's moral obligation is no longer to achieve their own welfare in coexistence with reality by remaining rational, but to keep choosing to be selfless, living for the collective to never violate the symbiosis, and to uphold through duty that they are never above the rest of life. Star Wars preys on the ontological requirements of sapience to remain bound to reality through rationality by demanding that all individuals must adhere to the symbiosis, and that violating it is irrational and psychologically corruptive. But even more vicious is that those that are born with a high midichlorian count must uphold the collective unity of symbiosis by perpetually choosing a moral code that denies all attachments to the material world, and to reject the potential to experience joy for the greater good of all life. Since the Force and midichlorians are respectively metaphysical and undeniable, the Jedi act rationally, morally following the directive of the setting to resolve the tension between sapience and the metaphysics of reality, teaching Force sensitives at a young age to be one with all of life and never use the Force negatively. The result is an eventual lack of emotions, spiritual disassociation with reality, and ego death. From a certain point of view, the philosophy of the Jedi is that of self-tyranny by displaying rigid self-control as to deny all personal attachments to the material world to mitigate the risk of feeling any anxiety and prevent the fear of loss. This metaphysical requirement to alienate oneself from the experiences to enjoy life is the subconscious reason people hate the Jedi. While those within the Star Wars community are generally unable to explain why they feel revolted by the nature of the Jedi, they understand on some level that something isn't right with Star Wars, and it echoes in their proclamation that the Jedi must be wrong. It is an outcry that adhering to the metaphysics of Star Wars is incompatible with the nature of sapience. Given the threat of permitting Force sensitives from potentially becoming corrupted and causing galactic oppression, there is no alternative but a rigid dichotomy of self-tyranny or a rebellion against all of life. The origin of the dichotomy is a misapplied meta-ethics between short and long-term joy. In essence, joy is positive stimuli received by acting properly according to the objective relationship of one's body and reality. The crucial point is that joy is neutral and dependent on its time measurement. When an individual acts appropriately over a short period, such as eating chocolate, they experience pleasure, but it fades over time. When an individual continually integrate their choices and values to act appropriately over the course of their life, achieving personal excellence through goal-oriented actions and creativity, in cases such as admiring one's own physique, having a long romantic relationship, or reflecting on a prosperous career, displaying that they are currently coexisting and flourishing with reality, they feel happiness. A common meta-ethical mistake is to establish pleasure as the end goal for one's actions which is momentary and unsustainable in the long term, such as eating chocolate all the time, 
as it is not accumulative, fulfilling, or reflective to the same degree as happiness. If one were to accept the premise that hedonistic pleasure is unsustainable and self-destructive because it is aimless beyond the desire to re-experience that first high, it leads to the conclusion that short-term joy is an invalid standard by which one can guide their life. However, by nonetheless still focusing on short-term joy as a primary value and goal for one's life, denying pleasure outright becomes the new standard. By having a deep awareness of the pain of another, accompanied by the wish to relieve it by serving others altruistically, it becomes the opposite standard. This perspective creates a false dichotomy by establishing that the only alternative to short-term joy is long-term servitude by rejecting pleasure, and it is the basis that built the entirety of Star Wars. In a panel discussion at the Academy of Achievement, Lucas explains the dichotomy between pleasure and compassion, and it is those ideas that underlies the Jedi and Sith. You, have, you live in two worlds here. Happiness is pleasure, and happiness is joy. You know, it can be either one. You add them up and it sort of falls under the uber category of happiness. Pleasure is short-lived, and it uh, peaks and then goes down. It peaks very high. But the next time you want to get that same peak, you have to do it twice as much. You know, it's like drugs. You, know, just, you have to keep doing it because it insulates itself, no matter what it is, whether you're shopping. Uh, it all has the same quality about it. On the other hand is joy, and joy is the thing that doesn't go as high as pleasure in terms of your emotional reaction, but it stays with you. Joy uh, is something you can recall. Pleasure, you can't. The secret is that even though it's not as intense as the pleasure, the joy will last you a lot longer. And people who get the pleasure, they keep saying, well, if I can just get richer and get more cars, you know, I can, I'll never, you'll never relive the moment you got your first car. That's it. That's the highest peak. If you're trying to sustain that level of peak pleasure, you're doomed. It's a very American idea, but it just can't happen. You just let it go. Peak, great. Pleasure is fun. It's great. But you can't keep it going forever. Just accept the fact that it's here and it's gone. And maybe again it'll come back and you'll get to do it again. Joy lasts forever. Pleasure is purely self-centered. It's all about your pleasure. It's about you. It's, about, it's a selfish, self-centered emotion that's created by a self-centered motive of greed. Joy is compassion. Joy is giving yourself to somebody else or something else. And it's a kind of thing that is, in its subtlety and lowness, much more powerful than pleasure. If you get hung up on pleasure, you're doomed. If you pursue joy, you will find everlasting happiness. What Lucas is echoing is that the enjoyment of short-term joy is aimless, self-destructive, and unfulfilling. And its negation, through compassion, by sacrificing the self to others, is superior because it is goal-oriented. The Sith rely on their passion for their strength. They think inwards only about themselves. And the Jedi don't. The Jedi are selfless. They only care about others. Mom, you say the biggest problem in this universe is nobody helps each other. And if America is the pursuit of happiness, the best way to pursue happiness is to help other people, because there's nothing else that'll make you happy. Acting as an amalgamation of mythologies and all larger religions, the conclusive message conveyed by the Star Wars franchise is simplistic, but insidious. Let. Go. If you are born with high intelligence and ability, let go of your ego and desires. Let go of all forms of joy. Let go of all attachments to reality. Let go of your life and die. Son, my place is here. My future is here. It is time for you to let go. Sometimes we must let go of our pride and do what is requested of us. Train yourself to let go of everything you fear to lose. Let her go, Anakin. Let her go. Use the force, Luke. Let go, Luke. You can't do this. I feel the conflict within you. Let go of your hate. It's a very American 
idea, but it just can't happen. You just let it go. While those that do not have a high midi chlorine count can flourish to their maximum potential, four sensitives cannot be permitted to experience personal joy or act selfishly. They must accept the duty to spiritually detach themselves from reality, live without emotions, train the next generation to do the same, and kill all those that reject the state of being. It is a metaphysical self-correcting system that perpetually balances the tension between sapience and nature by demanding that all those that are born special live in servitude to others for the greater good. This internal contradiction is most apparent with love. In essence, romantic love is the most joyful experience of life. It makes every moment better by its mere existence. Love is a strong, emotionally intimate relationship between consenting adults that combines an intense valuing of a partner on the deepest level. By recognizing the importance of someone, it becomes the most personal sense of attachment possible for a sapient life form. It means to care deeply about your partner's welfare, health, pleasure, success, and happiness because it gives you joy. A loved one is an irreplaceable treasure someone to be nurtured and protected, with whom you would want to grow and thrive as an equal partner for life. Human nature instinctively desires love because it matches our need to coexist with reality and flourish. To love someone is to do the same, but with another person's soul. However, since love is always selfish, it is bound by greed and the desire to keep being in love. In its loss, is the most painful experience in life, and therefore nearly impossible to let go. But despite how every human innately recognizes that love is grand, Star Wars does not permit those that are born special to be in love. It only allows duty to symbiosis and selflessly serving others. It is the reason why the Jedi forbid romantic love and only permit unconditional love towards the rest of life. Due to the existence of midichlorians and the Force that mystically demand spiritual disassociation with reality to remain rational, love is untenable for Force sensitives. Because while the reasons for being in love tend to be rational, it becomes nearly impossible to control desires or rationalize valuing of a partner on a conscious level. It does not mean that Force sensitives cannot fall in love and violate their duty, but that it cannot be maintained because it is fueled by strong emotions. In the prequel movies, Anakin found Padme to be beautiful and loved her determination, gentleness, and wit. And Padme loved Anakin's earnestness, strength, and inner goodness, which he directed to those around him. But due to Anakin's connection to the Force, it led him to desire power to prevent losing her. In the original trilogy, Luke almost fell to the dark side to prevent losing his sister. And while Han and Leia fell in love, they were initially written to be non-force sensitive. But it was later discovered that Leia had the potential to use the force during the events of Return of the Jedi. And therefore, the thematic meta-narrative of their dynamic was retconned, and their union ended in divorce as Leia trained to become a Jedi. After the release of the Rise of Skywalker movie, many argued that Ben should not have died after saving Rey's life, lamenting that their love never properly bloomed. However, that is the point. In Star Wars, those that are born special can desire love, but never achieve it long term. The Star Wars setting emphasizes that whenever Force sensitives choose to not fully adhere to the requirements of self-immolation by spiritually detaching themselves from reality to always live in the present, it comes at the cost of widespread death to restore the symbiosis across the galaxy. Adventure. <laughs> Excitement. <laughs> A Jedi craves not these things. And so? With all that context, what is the solution to save Star Wars? Nothing. As Qui-Gon stated, 
Without the midichlorians, life could not exist. By the existence of the five axioms, Star Wars can never end. There will always be four sensitives that can misuse the power of life and restart the cycle of warfare, requiring countless deaths to bring about the symbiotic status quo. Nothing short of generational genocide of all those with a high midichlorian count would end the perpetual wars. However, Star Wars uses four sensitives as a means to emphasize the tension between the symbiosis of life and the rebellion of sapiens against all of life. Removing such individuals would erase the central narrative and theme, where they act as paragons that drives the story of good fighting evil to restore harmony, and emphasize altruism and the requirements of letting go. The Star Wars setting is forever doomed to perpetuate the endless cycle of death to maintain and return to the symbiotic status quo. So long as the Force remains the linchpin, along with the interconnected five axioms, Star Wars will always promote the false dichotomy and starting position that the Jedi are good. In the Star Wars Episode 1, The Phantom Menace movie scrapbook, George Lucas stated, The Force evolved from various development of character and plot. I began to distill the essence of all religions and common primitive thinking. I wanted to develop something that was non-denominational but still had a religious reality. I wanted a concept of religion on the premise that there is a God and there is good and evil. I believe in God and I believe in right and wrong. The Star Wars setting dramatically proxies religion devotion and renunciation of reality while circumventing any direct worship of a God by having an energy field that symbiotically unites all life together, creating the metaphysical conditions that forever bind the meta-ethics of good and evil on the molecular level, demanding that all sapient beings exist with collective unity and that all those with magic-like powers, analogous to high physical and intellectual ability, have a duty to live selflessly and never form any personal attachments, lest they bring about widespread oppression. The undeniable presence of a stand-in God is a curse upon all sapient beings by permitting nothing else but spiritual self-immolation in a bloody universe of eternal cyclical death. Ultimately, there is only one thing people can do. Let go of Star Wars. As a whole, the Star Wars franchise encourages escapism by inviting the audience to see themselves in Luke and Anakin, and viewers are enthralled by the desire to also have adventures by flying a spaceship, interacting with wacky aliens, fighting in lightsaber duels, and using magic powers, all while masking the truth of what happens if one were to live in such a setting bound by the fundamentally present axioms. But. Star Wars hides the metaphysical mechanics that bind all sapient life through symbiosis and punish all those who are born special that desire to fully experience life. The characters in Star Wars live in a doomed galaxy. But we do not live in such a universe. In our world, there is no verifiably divine energy force capable of absolutely manipulating causality by existing above the law of identity, controlling all aspects of reality to such a degree that luck and chance do not exist. Star Wars becomes a display of what would happen were there no alternatives between servitude to the collective or the sacrifice of the collective for the self. It is a false dichotomy and we must reject it. By adhering to the law of identity, Embracing non-contradictory perspectives, recognizing that a thing is itself and cannot be anything else, as well as never violating the consent of sapient beings, we can establish a proper standard by which individuals can flourish. We can take solace in the fact that our reality is one where we can establish attachments and embrace the joys of life by acting properly in the long term 
through the choosing of life-affirming values and creating new things, flourishing in coexistence with reality and enjoying our lives while we have them. We are metaphysically free to live for ourselves without the existence of any axiomatic divine order. And that is truly a blessing in disguise. While Star Wars is enjoyable and commonly understood as a pulpy narrative fiction, its setting is immaculately structured in such a way that it can only be described as genius. In 2005, Lucas told Vanity Fair in an interview, The interesting thing about Star Wars, and I never pushed this very far because it's not really that important, but there's a lot going on there that most people haven't come to grips yet. But when they do, they will find it's a much more intricately made clock than most people could imagine. People may feel that Star Wars is silly, corny, and isn't to be taken seriously, but they mistake the intent and scope by which Lucas took every element of human culture, religion, and philosophy to create a monomyth that transcends all of art. Those that criticize the prequel movies as incompetent do not realize the magnitude of what George Lucas was conveying. They dismiss the prequels for failing as movies and refuse to engage them on their own terms. Technologically, Lucas is a pioneer to the degree of Picasso, utilizing new CG filming techniques a decade before they became common practice. Stylistically, similar to Van Gogh, Lucas continues to be misunderstood and perhaps it will only be following his death that people will come to fully appreciate his craftsmanship. What is undeniable is that Star Wars is an eternal masterpiece. It is one of the most significant artistic accomplishments of the human race. And I hate it. Men have been taught that the ego is the synonym of evil and selflessness the ideal of virtue. Here. The basic reversal is most deadly. The issue has been perverted, and man has been left no alternative and no freedom. As poles of good and evil, he was offered two conceptions, egotism and altruism. Egotism was held to mean the sacrifice of others to self, altruism the sacrifice of self to others. This tied man irrevocably to other men, and left him nothing but a choice of pain, his own pain, born for the sake of others, or pain inflicted upon others for the sake of self. When it was added that man must find joy in self-immolation, the trap was closed. Man was forced to accept masochism as his ideal, under the threat that sadism was his only alternative. This was the greatest fraud ever perpetrated on mankind.